Father in heaven, I do pray that you'll bless our time of studying your word. Uh, Lord, that it'll be just a delight to be in your word. It would refresh us and, uh, Lord, just be a sweet experience to hear what you have to say from your word. Uh, bless us, Lord, that we would ha <clears throat> have an understanding and, uh, Lord, just a great time of fellowship around the table. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. Some of you know that uh, I believe uh, that uh, in the Jesus built church model and the Jesus built church model that makes us uh, a, a Jesus built church <clears throat> in the Jesus church built model uh, I also have the Jesus life Jesus built life model and and they're both the same but <clears throat> the Jesus built model is based on the great confession that you are the Christ the son of the living God <clears throat> Peter made that great confession that become the great confession of faith the church is built on that in order to become a Christian, you have to, as we sang earlier, the, the creed, we believe, I believe, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. <clears throat> the second foundation or step, and here I got it in the cycle, is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> There's two aspects there. One is worship. I worship the Lord with all my heart. So whatever, that's how I love Him. We, we discovered that last fall. <clears throat> and I serve my neighbor I love through serving him when Jesus wanted to full, show the full extent of his love he got down on his knees and he washed the disciples feet he served them so <clears throat> we get Christian service there and the <clears throat> whoop, I clicked the wrong line and then the finally the, the Great Commission and Jesus said go and make disciples of all nations okay and we're gonna we're gonna de develop that Originally, this three weeks was supposed to hit one lesson on the Great Confession, one lesson on the Great Commandment, and one lesson on the Great Commission. <clears throat> I got carried away. So I don't know that we're going to get through all the material that I have. But if we don't, okay. Okay, you know. And, uh, and, but we're going we're gonna to cover the Great Confession. Uh, not so much the Confession as we are going to cover the life of Christ. And then the Great Commission. In fact, I got it outlined here. Week one, you'll see that in your book. You can just look at that. That's what we're going to cover. To, well, maybe we'll get it all today, maybe not. Uh, next week, or a part, a second half of this week, actually, was moving on to the book of Acts and dealing with uh, Paul's conversion and his journeys. And so the next two weeks, we're going to be really dealing with the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys. Okay, And so you can see those in there. My intentional goal was the fourth week to have a concert of prayer. Okay. And uh, but we got a business meeting that week. Oh, I didn't plan for that, but it was in the Constitution, and I had to give way to the Constitution. <laughs> and so uh, the concert of prayer will be the following week. So it, it'll be the first week of uh, March. Okay. So today I'm going to look at the life of Christ and uh, <clears throat> the life of Christ. To cover all four Gospels, that's a lot of territory. So we're not going to be touching on everything in the Gospels. Uh, I want you to imagine that uh, you get in an airplane, you take off, and, and when you're in the airplane, you look down, you no longer see the individual blades of grass. You just see green, you see whole green fields and all that, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You'll see, you see little tiny people, but you see the cars are a little bit bigger, but you, it's pretty hard to make out what model and make it is, because you're, you're so high up. Okay, well that's kind of like surveying, Bible survey, like if you're in a college. What I'm about to do is like, we just shot off in a rocket, and you're looking down at the whole globe of Earth, and you're seeing continents at a time rather than individual fields and all that. We're gonna go through the life of Christ at a rather rapid rate, okay? <clears throat> to begin with, we gotta know some basic geography. This will just kinda help you put everything in place. So the basic geography, I, I wanna do a little comparison. Uh, here is the land of Israel, okay? Uh, basically in the time of Christ, it, they didn't have firm borders, so that's just kind of approximate the borders of the region of, of the land of Israel. And so to give you a kind of an idea, I just superimposed that over Michigan. <laughs> and so what I, I am about to, to share with you is, with the exception of Jesus' flight as a, an infant child to Egypt, he was confined for his ministry basically in a space smaller than the state of Michigan. Okay. And that's pretty interesting. He wasn't not an international traveler, except for that little tiny span as, as, a, as an infant. Uh, but basically, everything takes place in the life of Christ is at a, like, I, I've never left the state of Michigan type thing. Now, <clears throat> on the map, 
Uh, this is the Mediterranean Sea, and if we were to put the whole map, you would have up here Turkey, you'd have Greece, Italy, further over Spain, all of this would be North Africa, and this is this region right here is, is the Israel proper, and uh, the Mediterranean Sea is the <clears throat> as far as you could go west in the land, okay? Now, there's certain seas. At the top is the Sea of Galilee. How many of you know that? That's, that's the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus walked on the water, guess what water he walked on? Sea of Galilee. You know, if he'd walked on the Dead Sea, they would have said, oh, it's just really salty and he was really buoyant. I mean, they would have had some... But, but the Sea of Galilee, okay, it is, uh, is fresh water, okay? And so that's the Sea of Galilee. That is at the top. Sea of Galilee goes southward, and it's really windy. It's really a winding river, and it overflows in certain seasons. Uh, like when we were in the book of Joshua, its banks had overflowed. It was a time of overflow when they crossed the Jordan River. And, and it goes down to the Dead Sea. Dead Sea is the lowest sea on the face of the earth. All the water goes in there, and nothing comes out. I mean, it evaporates. Okay? It's a salt, very high salt content in, in the sea. And somebody one time said, well, if you want to drain that, why don't you just dig a canal down here? Well, it's the lowest place. Even then, the, the, the Red Sea would flow into it, okay? So it's the lowest place on the earth. I want you to know these locations and kind of get them cemented in your mind. I used to do like, okay, let's pretend that the bottom there where is the wall right here, okay? This is the wall, okay? And so right here, let's say approximately right here is the Dead Sea going northward here, Jordan River. The Sea of Galilee sitting right here, so it's kind of on the floor. Way over here where this table is, this is the Mediterranean Sea. All right, so if I were to say Mediterranean Sea, Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, Dead Sea. Say it with me, all right? Mediterranean Sea, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. You're, class, you're awesome. <laughs> Reach over and give the person next to you a pat on the back. You did it really well. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> all right. Okay, I'm going to add to it. Now, this is where we're going to this game and we, we start adding some things to it. <clears throat> there are actually six regions uh, at the time of Christ, territories, that uh, were then known. This area is called Judea. Uh, it's kind of a play on the word Jewish. You can almost hear that. Judah, this tribe of Judah, okay? Jew, all that. It's this, this is the area of Judea. Uh, the Philistine nation was over here at one time. That's uh, the Gaza Strip. And Jerusalem's located right about there. We'll see that in a few moments. But this, this is the territory of Judea. So it's not, it's like, it's not, it's like southeastern Michigan. Okay, that's about the size of it. Okay, that the, the whole region. Now, just above that, so wait, wait, on my map, remember we got the map here? And the Sea of Galilee is at the top. Jordan River, Dead Sea. So this table is Judea. All right, they're, they're Judea, because they're occupying that spot. Just above Judea was an area called Samaria. You've heard of Samaritans. The Samaritans were a half-breed people. And we're gonna find out later that they were deported from Israel by the Assyrians in 722 BC and what the Assyrians did when they conquered a people they took another group of people that they had conquered and transplanted them there so they were mixed up it just it caused a lot of turmoil they couldn't pull together a rebellion and so they're half Jewish and they're half Gentile okay they're half who knows <clears throat> mutt okay <laughs> and so the Jews down in Judea they despise the Samaritans, okay? And so, but they're living right in their land. So we have, oh, you can say Mediterranean Sea, say Mediterranean Sea, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Judea, Samaria, okay? Just north of Samaria is a region called Galilee. And Galilee kind of goes around and crowns the, the Sea of Galilee. So it kind of just comes around the, the top half of the Sea of Galilee. So uh, <clears throat> these are regions that you hear about when you read the New Testament, the Gospels, where Jesus walked, what Jesus did. All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to go across the river. They're over. They're, i got to put a... You don't get a name yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Capolis. You can see the word Deca in it. 
Anybody know what Zedeka is? Ten. 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 ten Polis, ten cities. There were ten cities in that region. They're kind of scattered. That's why it's the shape it is. Ten cities that marked out that area. It was called Decapolis. All right? So, if I go from the very beginning, I got Sea of... Oh, Gal Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean sea of Galilee. Galilee Jordan River. Dead, Dead Sea. sea. Judea, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, Galilee, Galilee yeah. Decapolis. Yeah. And what we're missing here is a little place called Perea. 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 Not Berea, Perea. Yeah. All right? And Perea, now, I don't even put you guys on there, you're, but, but you do have a name. For those that want to write it down, be complete. Okay. It's Iturea. Iturea. I, I, letter I, T-U-R. Yeah, yeah. Iturea, like Perea, Iturea. <clears throat> that was the name of that region, but it does not play at all in where Jesus uh, traveled. So I don't include that. I used to include it just for completeness sake. But so <clears throat> from the very beginning, I got the Mediterranean Sea, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, the Capitalist, Perea. All right. You guys are doing good. If I turn that off, could you do it? Yeah. yeah we have it down. Okay, good, because I got more data. All right. <laughs> down in the area of Judea, there's a place called Bethlehem. Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem is Beth, house, lechem, which means bread. bread. House of bread. Okay. And so it's down here. And uh, so I guess I'm going to make you brother Bethlehem today. <laughs> I hope you had plenty of bread. House of bread. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got Bethlehem, not too far north. Well, yeah, quite a bit. Oh, I forgot how Up here in Galilee, at the bottom of Galilee, we have Nazareth. All right? Here's Nazareth. You can play Nazareth today. Nazareth. All right. And then I come back to Jerusalem. Oh, you want to be Jerusalem? You're on that spot. You're Jerusalem. <laughs> She's Jerusalem. All right. Okay. So we have the, the, the city of Jerusalem. And then, in the land... Who wants to be Sychar? Sychar. We got Sychar. All right. Sychar is in Samaria. And there's one last place I think I want to come. Capernaum. And Capernaum. Ruth, you want to be Capernaum? You're Capernaum. All right. Now, we got the, I got these locations. There's a lot more locations. But these are kind of the locations you need to know to follow a logical order in the movement of Christ through his life in his ministry. So let's start from the very beginning here. We have the Mediterranean Sea, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Judea, Samaria. Galilee, Decapolis, Perea. Down here's Bethlehem. Nazareth. Wait, who's Nazareth? Nazareth. Oh, you didn't name Sychar. Okay, nobody in Sychar. You didn't name anybody? Yeah. Sychar. Sychar is cool. Oh, here's Sychar. I was jumping. The order they occur. All right, Nazareth. Nazareth. Sychar. Well, who's. Ruth, you are Capernaum, Jerusalem. and then who is Jerusalem? Jerusalem. All right, you kind of got the idea here. You got these locations located? Yeah, we got it. All right. I did all that because there's a little key that I've used for a long time on remembering the ministry of Christ. <clears throat> you got to have this down. It goes east on the map, west on the map, North on the map, south on the map, east on the map, west on the map, is the major movements of Christ through the Gospels. Okay, we'll see that in just a moment. I'm going to put this all together. It's east and west, north and south, east and west. And if you got those locations in place, then you can put together the pieces of where he is at. And uh, this will all come together in a few minutes. Does that make sense, though? Yep. So we're talking, say with me, east and west, west. north and south, south, east, east and, and west. west. Very good. All right. When I put it all together, it works like this. <clears throat> Jesus had an early Perean ministry. He moved east on the map. After that, he moved west on the map. That's why I say east and west. 
to what theologians call, and Bible scholars call, his early Judean ministry. Okay, from Judah, Perea, Judah. <laughs> then what he does is he moves up on the map and he enters into an early Samaritan ministry. Okay, are you guys filling your blanks in? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right, and then he keeps going north to what I call the climactic Galilean ministry. It's in Galilee that he's going to spend the bulk of his ministry. Jesus was from the northern portion of the land. He wasn't with the elites in the southern. So we would have said he was a redneck from Kentucky. Okay? Because he was they were the backwards guys, okay? They were they were the fishermen. They were, you know, they, they were not uh, the businessmen of the day. So he 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 was he spends a bulk of his time with the common, ordinary people. That's where, you know, in the first Corinthians it says God has not chosen many wise, blah, 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 but he's chosen the foolish things, the base things, the low things of the world. He was talking about me. <laughs> he's talking about me, all right? So the climactic Galilean ministry was on the north end of the map. Coming south, he comes to his later Samaritan ministry, and then we go from there into his later Perean ministry. Uh, yeah, and uh, so what we have... And then it goes to closing events is west on the map for, uh, they don't say a later uh, Judean ministry, it's just all the closing events. The, the bulk of the Gospels are in the last week of Jesus' life and they're right here at the very end. So we have more information about that last one week than we do about the rest of the life of Christ. So this is uh, kind of the, the movement, you get what I'm doing here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> east, west, north, south, south east, east, west. Early Perean, early Judean. Early Samaritan, climactic Galilean, he's coming back down. Later Samaritan, then we go to the later uh, Perean ministry, coming back, closing events. So that, that's the, the way I remember it. Now, I want to talk about all of these. I'm going to go through them. Just this, we're going to survey what the whole life of Christ here. <clears throat> I call the very first thing opening events. And so if I were to you know, start this whole thing, I'd say like a package, opening events. And the opening events actually include him being born at Bethlehem down in Judea. So now i got a location, a place where Jesus was born. All right. And then after that, because in Matthew chapter 2, Herod wants to kill all the kids, right? Two years and younger because the guys didn't come back to tell him where the Messiah was born. And so this, the angel comes to, to Joseph and says, get your family out of here. And so they take their, they call it a flight to Egypt, but they didn't fly back then. They probably went by donkey, camel, or something else. And so they go to Egypt, and then he gets news that Herod has died by an angel, and he's told to go back. He goes back up to Nazareth, because that's where Mary and Joseph are living. They journeyed to Bethlehem to have the baby, so it will fulfill the prophecy of Micah chapter 5. Okay? And so now they, they, they're there. Now... The way that these movements work, they're major movements in the life of Christ. Because we know that while Jesus was growing up as a boy, he's made several trips down to Jerusalem. He, he made a trip to Jerusalem to be circumcised. He made a trip to Jerusalem uh, <coughs> when... Uh, uh, <coughs> The next time he made a trip to Jerusalem, he was 12 years old. 12, yeah. 12 years old, he was just a boy. And uh, he got lost in the caravan. But, but that's, I just put that all in the opening events. That he was born, he made a flight to, to Egypt. He comes back, he dwells in, in Nazareth. And there's very little written in the scriptures about this period of time. It's very short, little, little amount of scripture that we have about him. The next thing that we see, though, is that he's baptized by John in the Jordan River. Where the exact location is, we don't know, but we do know it's in the Jordan River. And because after that, he's going to go into the wilderness to be tempted, it's believed that he's going into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil somewhere in uh, the region of Perea. So he is in the, the early Perean ministry. He's baptized by John. It kicks off his public ministry. Jesus was baptized... To identify with John's message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so he is the king. And he's identifying with John's message. Everybody else with John was being baptized because of repentance. They were repenting of their sins. 
And so they got baptized, for the Bible tells us it was a baptism of repentance. All right? Not so with Jesus. He had no sin. So the question is, why did Jesus get baptized? He wasn't repenting. He was identifying as the king of the kingdom that they were repenting to be a part of. And he did it, the scripture says, to fulfill all righteousness. It was the right thing for him to do to identify with John. So he was tempted, he was uh, baptized by John. He's taken and tempted, in, and we find that record in Matthew chapter 4. And Matthew chapter 4, uh, you remember there's three temptations. Every time Jesus answers the temptation with the same quotation, it is written. It is written. I love the Greek text on this. It's in the perfect tense. And if I could elaborate that, it, it would be, he was saying, it stands written. Because the perfect tense means it was written and it is still continuing to this day. And so he, he used the tense there, at least the writers did, saying that what was written back then is still true today. Okay, it stands written. So he, he <clears throat> that's why the word is so important. Even Jesus used the word of God in order to combat a temptation. <clears throat> it's here also that he calls his first followers uh, to you know, come and follow him. And so that's all taking place in his early Perean ministry. So, so he's, we have opening events. He goes east on the map. Next, he's going to go west on the map. He comes to Jerusalem. We find this in, in <clears throat> John uh, chapter 2. And in Jerusalem, it says the zeal of the Lord has eaten him up. He is so upset because they had made the Father's house a den of thieves. They were, it was required when you came to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice, that you have a pure, good sacrifice. People would bring them, but you know how it gets. It's big business. They were saying, your offering's got a flaw. You gotta buy one of our temple offerings. And then they were at an exorbitant rate and they were pocketing the money. And so, they. Jesus gets all upset about this. He overthrows the money changers. He makes a whip. He drives them all out of the temple because you're not to make my father my father's house is a place of prayer and you made a place of business. So he cleanses the temple in Jerusalem and that, that is followed by a man by the name of Nicodemus. <laughs> Nicodemus, it says in John chapter 3, was a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God for nobody can do the miracles you do except God be with them. And Jesus looked right at him and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Boom. He, he just lowered the boom on him. And, and Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Now, can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? He says, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it desires, and you hear the sound thereof, and you, but you can't tell where it's going next. So it is with everyone that's born of the Spirit. That which is flesh is flesh, but that which is of the Spirit is spirit. And so Jesus is instructing him, and then, then we get down to like verse uh, 13 where, in, in John chapter 3 <clears throat> where the, Jesus says, I'm testifying to the things that I've seen. You testify to the things that you don't know about. <laughs> he says, Listen, the Son of Man came down from heaven. Okay? And he's testifying about this. And you don't understand them. He fully expected Nicodemus to know what he was talking about. Why? Because in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, it talks about God giving them a new heart. A new heart. And he's going to associate with that. Then Jesus does something really cool. Je Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Anybody remember that story? Mm -hmm. Numbers 21. They were all in the wilderness. They were complaining against God. And Moses and God sent fiery serpents out. They bit the people. And all, they were dying. And so they said, came to Moses. First time they ever asked Moses to pray. He said, Moses, pray for us. And so Moses prays. And God says, Build a serpent, a, a, a brazen serpent. Put it on the pole. And it said, anyone who looks to it will live. But if you don't look to it, I mean, the text doesn't say this, but if you didn't, you would die. And so he lifted up that serpent. Everybody looked to it. They live. And so the idea, you, we have a song, an old hymn. Look and live. Look and live, my brother. Remember that? Yeah. Look and live. And so the whole idea is, it's not just I see it. It's I deliberately in faith believe and I look. So the whole concept there of looking is in trust. So much so that I think that the same thing happens in, uh, in Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, a day is coming when the nation Israel is going to look on him whom they have pierced. And the idea is that they look finally with faith. And so the nation is saved in a day, according to uh, Romans chapter 11. Anyway, he's telling Nicodemus, don't you know your Old Testament? Don't you know your Bible? 
Weren't you at Sunday school, like a Sabbath school? Did you go to Sabbath school? <laughs> and told about how Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? And everyone looked at him. He said, even as, the, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Then we have that famous verse. Everybody knows this one, right? John 3, 16? Right. Yeah. The, the question is, did Jesus' discussion stop at verse 15 and John now is writing a commentary on that? Or is this still Jesus talking? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Then it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that has a Son is not condemned. Okay, but he that has not the Son is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what we have here in this text, <clears throat> this is like the central passage of the whole Bible. I mean, most famous verse, and, and it, it ties the old and the new together, and it's about the redemption of God, and the whole idea is we should know. We should know. We should know. And so the, the whole chapter ends by saying, he that has the Son has life, and he has not the Son has not life, <coughs> but the wrath of God remains on him. It's not that if I, I, I'm neutral and if I accept Jesus or I don't accept him, I don't accept him, I'm just neutral. No, 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 no. You're guilty already. You're under the wrath of God. And so you need the Son. You need to believe because if you believe, you're no longer under the wrath. But if you don't believe, it remains on you. You're already under it. So this is a very crucial passage. Anyway, <clears throat> we have moved in on the map or east on the map and west on the map. Now he's going to move north, John chapter 4. We come to John chapter 4, and Jesus said to the disciples, uh, we must needs go through Samaria. That's King James verse. I'm sorry, I memorized so many verses of King James. <laughs> but he said, we must needs go through, through Samaria. He said, I had to. Now, why, why that is so important is because, as I said earlier, the Jews hated, despised the Samaritans. In fact, to go to Galilee, they didn't go straight through they didn't, they didn't go straight through Samaria. Instead, they would cross over into Perea. They would cut up into Decapolis. And then they would cut back across into Galilee because they did not want to even go through the territory where the Samaritans were. That would be like just circumventing a whole town because it was a, some other nationality that you didn't like. You were, and that's what they were doing. So when Jesus said, I've got to go to Samaria that he heads up through through Samaria and he stops outside a place called Sychar. And that's what I got out here, Sychar, right? So he's left Jerusalem, he's making his way up to, to Sychar and he meets a woman at the well. This is a great story. How many know the story of a woman at the well? It's a great story. Because he says to her, you know, he says to her, uh, hey, give me a drink, give me a drink. She, she said, whoa, how is this that you're a Jew? speaking to me a Samaritan and a woman no less because back then you didn't talk to a woman you didn't talk to a woman that was out at the well at noon because that meant and she was all by herself which meant she didn't go with the rest of the ladies because the rest of the ladies thought she was a lady perhaps of the night and she was going so late in the day and so she's got all these strikes against her and on top of all she's a Samaritan woman and Jesus says give me the drink so that blows her away. He's really piqued her interest. How could this be that, that you're, you're asking of me? And she, he says, well, if you know who I was, you know, you'd ask me for living water. And she said, wait a minute. You have nothing to draw with. You're asking me for water? You're going to give me water? Uh, hey, are you greater than our father, uh, Jacob, who dug this well? And, 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 and he says, hey, if you, if you really knew who I was, uh, you'd be asking me for the drink. And, and she says, well... And he said it would be living water bubbling up into eternal life. And so she says, well, we would all said, get me to drink. I'll take some of this, eternal life. And he says, he changes the subject on her. He says, oh, go call your husband. Go call her, your husband. Well, the woman at this point says, well, I have no husband. And she says, oh, you've answered correctly, right? <laughs> you've answered, because you, not only do you not have a husband, you've had five, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. This woman has had so many broken relationships that she's given up on the institution of marriage and she's just living with the guy. Oh, it sounds like America today, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. It sounds like America today? And so, and so she says, oh my goodness, he's exposing my sin. He knows something about me. How does he know this? And so 
<clears throat> she says to him, well, you know what? She changes the subject. Isn't that the way it goes? So as you're starting to deal with somebody in their life and it's getting a little bit too close to home, we change the subject. Hey, what do you think about those lions? <laughs> uh, they just totally change the subject. She said, her way of changing the subject is, oh, you Jews believe that you should worship in Jerusalem, but Samaritans believe we should worship in the mountains of Samaria. She's changed the subject. And Jesus, he just flows with that. And Jesus just says, hey, the time is coming and now is. Well, you'll never, it doesn't matter where you worship, in Jerusalem or in Samaria, but those who worship God will worship Him in spirit and truth. Now at that moment, the disciples had gone into town to get something to eat, bring it back, probably McDonald's, I'm not sure. But he goes, they go into town, find something to eat, and they bring it back to Jesus. And, and as they're arriving, she quick gathers her stuff and she scoots out of there. They're all amazed that He was talking to this woman. But the woman goes back into the town of Sychar. And she goes to the people and she says, I just met a man who told me everything I ever did. So there must have been a lot more conversation than just as recorded. Okay? And then she adds this. And I try to, I'm trying to phrase it the way the Greek text puts it. He couldn't be the Messiah, could he? She knows that she doesn't have a reputation of credibility. So she postures the question in such a way that you have to decide. He couldn't be the Messiah, could he? So what happens? They all come running and streaming out. And the Bible says in John chapter 4, many believed in him. Isn't that amazing? One woman posturing the question that nobody would ever believe me. Better see for yourself. They go out, they come to Jesus, and they believe in him. I, well, I, I get from this story, there's nobody's history that is so bad they can't be a testimony for Jesus. You may have to do it the back door approach. He could possibly save you, couldn't he? I mean, if he did something for me, he could possibly do it for you, couldn't he? And so this, is, this took place at Samaria. Well, anyway, they went directly through the land, and then we find that he goes up uh, north, and he comes to his hometown of Nazareth. And at Nazareth, he goes into the synagogue, he teaches, and he is rejected by his own people. His, those, and he, Jesus said, a prophet is without honor in his own town. The prophet is without honor in his own hometown. Um, I've always found it. I was blessed. I, I grew up in the Brian Baptist Church of Detroit. And any time I'd come home, the pastor there would ask me to preach because I was the homegrown preacher boy. <laughs> you know right? And so I found always a lot of honor there. But at, at this point, they're saying, the people that knew him the best rejected him the best the earliest. They're the first ones that would have nothing to do with them. So he's rejected at Nazareth. And we're in the climactic Galilean ministry right now. And uh, there's so many things that happen here. This is the bulk of his ministry. If Jesus was baptized by John in his 30th year of his life, and was crucified in his 33rd year of his life, that's three years. Well, probably 18 months of it, a year and a half of that ministry time, was all up in this region. He's ministering to these people. The others were the other places that he was at. So this is the bulk of his ministry. It's at Capernaum. And one of the famous things that I had hoped that we were going to cover was the Sermon on the Mount. I just can't pack everything into one of these things. <laughs> but but uh, the Sermon on the Mount where, where Jesus preaches the great sermon with the Beatitudes. And, and then the real heart of that passage is your, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you're not going to enter the kingdom. Whoa. The righteousness of the Pharisees. These were the most righteous. They kept the law down to the letter. And Jesus said, that's not good enough. You know what you need? The righteousness of Jesus. That's the whole point. You cannot do anything to save yourself. You've got to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. And He's the one who will save you. So He preaches the Sermon on the Mount up near Capernaum. That's why I put it up in the region of Capernaum. Um, actually north of there. We know that he fed the 5,000 in that area. We know also that he walked on the water in the sea. That was the Sea of Galilee. That's where he walked on the water. And I'm, how can I, they can't hit on everything that Jesus did in this ministry. There's so much in there. I can't talk about everything that he, he preached on. But you get the general flow here. He did the walking on the water. And then a after he has this climactic Galilean ministry, the other thing that starts to take place is his popularity among the masses has soared. But among the elites, he is getting more despised and despised and despised because the people are following him 
And that is threatening their own ministry. And really, it's threatening a lot of their ministry, like their bucks at the temple. And it's threatening like, uh-oh, he's got such a following. The Romans are going to come down on us. And so they're worried about the Roman Empire that has control. And, and so even though he's coming down, now he comes to Samaria. And, and I got the woman here saying, get out of here. But she didn't do that. But I didn't have any other picture. To push. <laughs> so I made this picture. This time he comes through and they want, he, he says he has his face set as a flint to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem because Jesus has already been announcing he knows he's going to go and, and die for our sins. So he's got to go to Jerusalem and all of that. And, and when he tells them that he's on his way to Jerusalem, they don't want him to stay in their town because he, they don't want him to be among the Jews. So there is reverse discrimination going on here. Did you notice that? No, if you're going to go to Jerusalem and be, you know, the Messiah of the Jews, then we don't want any part of you. And so at Samaria, actually, instead of Sychar, so they're two different cities, they reject Jesus. So I put this as a ministry of rejection. It's building in, in, the, in the text. As he keeps going south, okay, he, he comes to, to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, there is an attempt to stone him. An attempt to stone him. Uh, Jesus says, been speaking and talking and, and they actually pick up stones to stone him but the text says he slips out of their midst and so you can see the building of the negativity towards those uh, you know he came unto his own his own re received him not they rejected him so then we have that he goes east and uh, on the map to his later Perean ministry uh, and we have the story of the, the rich young ruler uh, over here remember the story where you know why do you call me good and uh, so <clears throat> Jesus actually points to the fact that, that he, his wealth is in his way. Other things are included in the Perean ministry that are not actually in Perea, like uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. But it's actually, Bethany is a place that, that took place, if you recall, Bethany. All right. and, and it's actually east of, of Jerusalem, so they include that in this Perean period. Uh, and I didn't put it on here, but, but I could have Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and there's just a few other things that go on in that period. But then as he final movement back west, all right, I call these closing events. He moves westward. He goes into Jerusalem for the very last time. And he enters Jerusalem in this triumphal entry. Now the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ, I also call the triumphal tragedy. Because as he is triumphantly entering as a king on a donkey, that's the way kings would have come into the city, the triumphal tragedy is they're about to reject him as their king. The children are shouting, Hosanna, Lord save, Lord save, Lord save. But the priests and the Pharisees and all the, the, the elites of the city are telling them, tell the kids to be quiet. And Jesus said, if I told the kids to be quiet, the stones would cry out. Okay? Because he had to be praised. He's, he's the king coming in. We have the triumphal entry, and then we have the arrest, uh, you know, on that uh, Monday, Thursday night, you know, after he celebrates the Lord's Supper and, and the things that are going on at that time. Uh, they go out to the garden. He's arrested. He experiences illegal trials through the night. Okay. And then after those illegal trials and the beatings that were associated with that, he is crucified. After he is crucified, you know what, they, they took him down. They, and, they, and uh, he didn't have a, have a burial chamber, so he, he, he's buried in another man's tomb. And uh, he lays there for three days. He's resurrected from the dead. He comes back alive on Easter, and we're going to celebrate that on April 1st this year. And then 40 days later, he ascends into heaven. He ascends into heaven. And uh, he was seen on earth, and then he ascends into heaven. Those are the closing events. I don't know that I could summarize this whole story. <laughs> Pretty good. How do you think? Did, that, did you follow all that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't this an amazing story? Yes. Yeah. And so, let's see, we've been at this for 45 minutes. Which means I only got 45 minutes to go. <laughs> so, hey, um, I put in there um, a harmony of the Gospels, okay? Now what a harmony is, is you take all the passages that are similar and you put them right next to each other. They actually make the harmony of the Gospels as a, a New Testament Gospels, so that they're all in columns next to each other. 
I got them all here. The opening events, you can find them recorded in these passages. The early Perean right here. The early Judean mm. is just in one book, John 2, all right? Early Samaritan, one, one place, John. The climactic Galilean, it's huge. It goes from Matthew 4 to Matthew 18. Mark 1, 14 to 9, 50. Luke 4 to 9. John 4 through 7. It's that large chunk where Jesus is doing the majority of his teaching, his preaching, the miracles, and all of that. The later Samaritan, just a short five verses. All we have on that, okay? Uh, later Judean, which I forgot to put in those slides. I have to correct those. Later Judean, I got that in there. Later Perean. Closing events with the Passion, the Resurrection, and the Ascension. You can take your Bible and read through those. The other thing you could do is like today, I spoke from Jesus speaking in Matthew 13. It was in his climactic Galilean ministry. You know exactly now where it was at. It was in Galilee. You know, it was in that region. It was where his popularity takes a turning point from being accepted and rejected. Matthew 12, we saw the rejection of Jesus Christ by them saying, what you're doing, you're doing by the power of Beelzebub, okay? The masses are still all gathering to him. He's so crowded, he's got to get in a boat, go offshore. You see, you see how this all fits together? Because I know where the regions are with a little key like this. Anytime I'm reading a passage in the Bible from the Gospels, I can plot it and say I know exactly what part of his ministry he was in when this took place. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so I got a question for you. Why do you suppose there were four Gospels, not just one? Different audiences. Different audiences. Okay, what might the audiences be? Well, Matthew wrote for the Jews. Okay, good. Anybody else? John's was more of a... It wasn't like a... a, 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 a you know, like... In, 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 in chronological order, it was, and, and it wasn't just the facts. His was more uh, a, a higher level, so to speak. Theological. Yeah, more theological. Yeah, okay. Theological. Somebody else. Different details by different individuals. Different details by different individuals. What else? Th these are good. Why four gospels? Well, they so they sort of uh, help to solidify the real. Uh, history of Jesus because you're getting it not just from one source but from four different sources and they dovetail cool cool mm -hmm. imagine that we're all uh, on uh, at an intersection we're on there's four of us and we're on four different corners of the street the intersection and a car comes flying through and smashes into one and we all have to write a report right. exactly. and our report would all be written a little differently about the exact same event and when you pull them all together okay you would be able to you know put it together you, you get the comprehensive picture or say in the Super Bowl today they're gonna have multiple cameras and when they there's going to be a discrepancy on a call, and they're going to replay it from every single angle so they can determine what is the real story here. The Gospels are the same way. And you hit it on the head. I was looking at not so much as the audiences. Four different perspectives. Matthew is writing to the Jews, and when he writes, his concern is to show that he is the king of the Jews. So he starts out the Gospel of Matthew, very simply. He starts out putting the name, this is the genealogy of David, the son of Abraham. He put David in front of Abraham. That would have been a no-no. But he does it because the name David is a Daleth Vav Daleth in, in Hebrew, okay? Three letters, and he divides his genealogy up at the very beginning into three categories. When you add those letters up, um, six and a four six and four it adds to 14. there are 14 people in every single one of those genealogies he has thematically done this to focus jesus is the son of david the king david's name is mentioned three times the most in the genealogy he wants you to know right from the get-go that my story is to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the King of the Jews. That's, what he, that's who he's writing to, the Jews. Now, Mark, 
most believe that Peter is actually the one who tells the story, and Marcus is the amanuensis, the guy that wrote it down, the secretary, and he gets credit for it. I like that. It's not too often that the guy that writes the book you know, takes the notes, second line. But anyway, the focus is not on, uh, on the kingship, but it starts out with the servant, that Jesus is the servant of the Lord. So, as a genealogy is really important to a king, is it important to a slave? No. No, that doesn't matter. Anybody can be a slave, but you've got to prove your genealogy to be a king. Mark, you go to Gospel of Mark, it skips the genealogy. There's no genealogy. Instead, the key work in the, the Gospel of Mark is a little phrase, immediately. <laughs> immediately. Immediately Jesus did this. Immediately he did that. Immediately. Why? Well, when the Lord tells you to do something, you better do it immediately. And so he is the servant of the Lord. So we've got this little key word all the way through the gospel. Now Luke. Luke is, is, is a, a physician. He's a doctor. He's a physician. And so he is concerned, and the focus of his, his gospel is that Jesus is genuinely human. And he brings out little details about G Jesus that he was tired. And the things that, that he notices, like even in the book of Acts, he'll say that his ankle bones were broken. <laughs> he, he gets down to medical terms because he's really concerned about the humanity of Jesus. Now John's perspective is he starts from the whole fact that Jesus is God. And so everywhere <laughs> through his gospel, he's demonstrating that this was God who came in the flesh. This is God. And so he's got different reasons. Matthew to the Jews. Uh, Mark is usually considered to be to the Romans because they wouldn't have cared about his genealogy either. Uh, Luke is just writing about to mankind. And, and John is writing the fact that this is deity. We're talking about deity. So we're getting four perspectives on the life of Christ that gives us this well-rounded out picture of who Jesus is. So I want to ask a question. Which of these Gospels is your favorite and why? Which gospel is your favorite? Why? John for me. John. How many say John? All right. Who's going to say why? Why John? For me, it's that he shows that the, the true, uh, like the angels declared that Jesus was the uh, was God. That he's God. The yes. fact that, that I'm worshiping the Lord. It ends with uh, Thomas, remember at the end it says, my Lord and my God, when he, when he finally sees Jesus alive, and he says, hey, feel my hands, feel my prints, and, 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 and Jesus, he doesn't have to, he just says, my Lord and my God, my God. So the whole, that's the whole thing. Anybody pick uh, like Matthew, Mark, or Luke? A lot of people pick Mark. You know, want to know, not know why? It's the shortest. <laughs> <laughs> it's the shortest. Some think it was the first one written. And, uh, and the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar. They're, they have so much similarity. They think Mark wrote the original one and the other two guys had his in hand while they wrote their own. I don't believe that. No? Okay. I'm, I'm kind of an oddball in that because I go counter all, all the other. I think Matthew was the first because he's writing to the Jews. I think, and, and he's trying to win the Jews. And, and Paul says we preach the gospel to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. And so I just think that there's a priority in Matthew. And Mark kind of has a shorter because he's re trying to reach the Roman world. And Luke is a physician, and his is a part of a two-set volume. Volume number one is Luke. Volume number two is Acts. Acts, the book of Acts. And so, in fact, the introductions to both books are so so similar. Okay, so he he's writing uh, for all mankind, and then John. Anybody choose Matthew besides me? I like Matthew. I like Matthew. Matthew is like my favorite of the Gospels. I, I prefer to read Matthew. Uh, most people, I do think, pick John, probably because the most famous verse in the whole world is in it, John 3.16. Yeah. yeah, I like John. You like John? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it's okay to have favorites, okay? It is. Well, one thing that would point me to Matthew is, is the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the only one that really... Yeah. That in yeah, Matthew is developed thematically. It's, it's chrono chronological, but he's got a section. Oh, is that my phone or is that no, someone's phone? Really oh, okay. Trying to get it. Yeah. 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 Can I sidetrack for a moment? I was doing a, a, a chalk drawing at a ladies' group one time, 
and my phone went off when I was praying. <laughs> oh dear. And it, I didn't have it on silent, and it's ringing, it's ringing. I just kept praying till it finally ended. <laughs> and I said, yeah. Amen. <laughs> Every woman that was there reached for her purse to see if it was her phone. <laughs> they never knew it was yours. They didn't know it was mine. <laughs> oh, no. So I decided next time that happens to me, although I turn my I turn mine on vibrate, if that happens to me again, I'm just gonna say, hold on, yes, Lord. <laughs> All right. All right. So let me. Let, how much we got? Well, 20 minutes. Let's see if we can't jump into a little bit of the Book of Acts here. Okay. At least get the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna call this the recommission, because in Matthew 28. Before Jesus, you know, ascends into heaven, he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right? The Great Commission to go and make disciples. When we come to the book of Acts, we have that same commission given, I think, as a recommission. He's reminding them. There should be a reminder commission, not so much a recommission. He says, But you will receive power in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Now, I got expert witness here. They were expert witness. They were eyewitnesses. They lived with Jesus. Okay, they slept. They, they, they ate. They did everything with Jesus for three years, or some a little shorter because they didn't join in at the beginning. And he says, in all Judea, it's a threefold witness. First of all, you're going to be a witness in your own community in Jerusalem. And then he says, and then in the region of Judea and Samaria. So I took, here's the region of Judea, Samaria. He said, I want you to be witnesses in this region. And then he adds, and to the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts actually works that way. Acts chapter 1 through 7 talks about how the gospel spread in the city of Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, okay, in AD 32, okay, <coughs> 3,000 people accept Jesus and are baptized on one day. I'd love to have been there for that. But as I learned today from our Bible verses, God set the time that I should live in the 21st century. And so I didn't get to see that. I just got the record. of First in Jerusalem. Then chapters 8 through 12 talks about how a persecution broke out. And God caused it. So that they would be scattered, scattered. They were all huddling together. And he said, no, no, you're not fulfilling the Great Commission. So persecution breaks out. And they all scatter. And so they're, now they're starting to fulfill the Great Commission. And then when we get to chapters 13 through 28, we find uh, the missionary journeys begin of the Apostle Paul, which we're going to focus quite a bit upon. But if I can get through Paul's conversion today, I will be happy. <laughs> it begins in chapter 8, verse 1, actually. In 8, verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul, that was his name before his conversion, Saul, he was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. He was the least likely person on the planet to have been picked to take and lead a missionary trip, a journey, or to be the champion of it, because he was actually on the other side trying to wipe us out. He was like a bounty hunter. He was like, yeah, he was like a bounty hunter. And so... It says, and he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus. So let's get Damascus on there. He wants to go to Damascus so that he can round up Christians, incarcerate them, because he is so against this thing called Christianity. So that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, that's what we were originally called, people of the way. Right? Why? Anybody know why we're called the people of the way? The way, the truth, the life. Jesus said, I am the I way. Am the truth. So they were the way people. All right? Before we were ever called Christians, we were called the people of the way. And so, so <clears throat> he wanted to gather up the Christians that are called by the way, uh, whether men or women, that he might take and take them to prison uh, in Jerusalem. So, <clears throat> then it says, but Acts chapter 9, his mission of going to Damascus, because he got the, the letter permission to go, his, his mission is interrupted. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground. So he's going with his partners. They got the letter in hand. They're going to go round up Christians and he's happy as can be. And all of a sudden he had a major interruption in his life. He probably thought it was a disruption. 
You ever have that? Something that just a little disruption in life messes everything up for the day? Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, I was coming here to church the sun, the Saturday that we were um, passing out all the food, and I hit a pothole and I had an instant flat. Oh. It was ice cold, chilly out. So oh. I get on the phone and I call for AAA to come and help me. And they said, okay, we'll send somebody. And I looked, they said, you can track the timing on it. And I looked, it was going to be like three hours. <laughs> oh, my. So I got out and changed my own tire <laughs> and came over rather than do that. And so I was so glad that I had decided that day. You know that really fancy suit I have, my, my birthday suit that yes. looks like Christmas? <laughs> I had thought about wearing it over here. Did you see me out on the side of the road? <laughs> 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 you might have had some the good help thing you everybody you else would see them. <laughs> so I, I managed to, I, I thought, you know, I'll just bring it with me in case I really don't want to wear it the whole time because it was a little tight. I'm so glad I did that. Anyway, he had a major disruption. He thinks he's going to go up, get some brownie points for being a good Jewish boy, rounding up all these Christians or the people of the way, and all of a sudden a flashing light hits him, strikes him down, and, uh, and he hears this voice to, that comes to him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? What's he call him? Lord. Lord. He knew right then. Uh, later in Acts chapter 22, it talks about uh, that, that. I think that was his conversion moment, the moment he called him Lord. He called him Lord. All right. uh, <clears throat> so who are you, Lord? And it says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And then it says, now get up and go to the city that you will be told what to do. And then so the men that were traveling with them, uh, was, <clears throat> Saul, stood there speechless. Now, they heard a sound, but they didn't see anyone. Later, we're told they heard a noise. They, they didn't hear the actual words Paul heard. And uh, so he got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand. He was blinded. Talk about God getting someone's attention. I used to have an expression, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, God hit me with a two-by-four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Or, uh, I may be uh, hard of hearing, but Lord, I'm not deaf. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, he really got his attention here. He's blind. He can't see. And so he's being led by the hand. Uh, so they led him to Damascus. And he wasn't expecting this at all. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And he met a, a Jesus follower. This is cool. God had led him by the hand to a man that was following Jesus. And in Damascus there was this disciple by the name of Ananias. And uh, God says to Ananias... Jesus said, go to, go to, this man is my chosen instrument car to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and peoples of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer. 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 Did you ever hear that, you know, the gospel uh, track, uh, that gospel approach that says, uh, God loves you and has a, a wonderful plan for your life? I don't know if that's always the case. God does love you, but it's not always, it's going to be a rosy path of life as a Christian. God loves you. Does he have an ultimate wonderful plan for your life? Yes. Ultimately, I go to heaven, I can be spent eternity. Between there and now, I might have to suffer for his name. Wow. He says, uh, go. So he's telling Ananias, hey, I've got this guy, uh, and Ananias has got a response. He says, Lord, we've heard many things about this guy. You sure you got the right guy? <laughs> Pretty much. And he said, yep, he's my instrument. And immediately when Ananias lays his hands out immediately something like scales from Saul's eyes are dropped and he could see again <clears throat> now I say all that because now we're going to fast forward 10 years 10 years he's been converted he's been on the backside of the desert being trained in, in Arabia being trained by the spirit of God and, and a lot of if you read Galatians chapter 1 you know a lot of things are happening to him and, and, I, and I want to just start the first missionary journey he's come to conversion He's been tested and uh, at the church in Antioch. See, we've already moved from Jerusalem. we got to start here to Samaria, Judea and Samaria. It's already spread to Antioch. And there was at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene. Anybody know where Cyrene is? Cyprus? Cyprus. Libya. Oh, Libya. This is Black History Month. This guy, Lucius, he's probably one of our black brothers. 
I'm, ju I'm just saying. He's from Cyrene. Where was the guy that uh, helped Jesus with the cross? Cyrene. 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 Yeah. Mm. Another black brother. I'm telling you what. Um, because the gospel went to Europe, okay, and the Muslims wiped out the African church pretty much, okay, all of our paintings show Jesus as an Italian guy. <laughs> he was not. He was not. And so I, I think we're all going to be surprised when we see Jesus that he's going to be Middle Eastern. And you're going to say, that's not the way Da Vinci painted him. <laughs> that's not the way Michelangelo did it. But you know, we're going to love him. We're going to love him. We're going to love him. All right. So anyway, it says these people in the church uh, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and there was Saul. Here's Saul, our, guy, our, our key guy. He, he's the guy persecuting the church, but now he's part of the church. And, and while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, and I don't have a symbol for the Holy Spirit, so I got Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Wow. It's over 10 years in preparation to go on this missionary journey. We just commissioned, and we're going to see that they were commissioned very similar to what they did here. They prayed, they fasted, prayed, and they placed their hands on him. That's exactly what we did for the goods. We prayed, we laid our hands on him. If some of you were at the commissioning service, we prayed on him, and we sent them out. How many years was he in training? Oh my goodness, a lot of years. He's got practice as a pastor here in West Bloomfield, right? They prayed on them, and then they sent them off. Okay, I got them sent off. They sent them from Antioch, and they laid their hands on them, and they sent them off, and the two of them were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, and they went down to Seleucia. I'm going to put Seleucia on the map, for those of you who want to track all of these. And they sailed from Seleucia to Cyprus. There's Cyprus. And uh, once they arrived at Cyprus, it says that when they arrived at Salmis, let's get Salmis on there, they proclaimed the word of, the God, word of God in the, the <laughs> synagogues, and a guy by the name of John was with them, their helper. Mostly that's John Mark, and John Mark, now there's three. There's uh, uh, <clears throat> Paul, Barnabas, and this guy, John Mark. He hooks up with them here. I didn't put a picture of him, sorry. I just didn't have my camera that day to get his picture. <laughs> you guys know that I, all these pictures are just guesswork, okay? And they traveled, the three of them, through the whole island and came to Paphos. That's at the other end of the island, all right? And uh, there they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. I don't know what he really looked like, but this kind of looked like a guy I could put in there. But Bar-Jesus was there, and he's a false prophet. He's a Jewish guy. And uh, he attended the proconsul Sergius Paulus, who wanted to hear the word of God. Okay, Paul's preaching. People are gathering probably like what Jesus was. And so Sergius Paulus, hey, I want to hear this guy. But the sorcerer did not this false prophet Jewish guy, he opposed him and, and tried to turn the proconsul from their faith. And that was not a good idea, as we're going to see. Because what happens next is then Saul, who is called Paul, now we got his name change. Now that he's on the missionary journeys, he's going west, we're going to eventually go into Europe. Uh, he's taken on a more European uh, uh, name. Uh, he moves from Saul to Paul. He says, you are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit, tricker. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? And then this is what happens. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind from a, for a time. You will be unable to see the light of the sun. Hmm, who's that sound like? <laughs> yeah, what goes around, comes around. What, what came to me goes around. Yeah, you get yeah, and immediately darkness fell on the sorcerer, and when the proconsul saw what had happened, he did what? Believed. Believed. It's the power of God. It wasn't what Paul, it was the power of God. God was, was using Paul, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. It's a, I find this very interesting. He believed not because of what happened, but, but because of what was taught. It is the word of God that is the power. All the miracles were done just to verify the message. But it's the message, the word of God, that leads unto salvation. All right? Then we have from there, from there, Paul, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed up to per Perga in Pamphylia 
where that young John Mark, he left them and returned to Jerusalem. Wow, this becomes really important as we go on in the story next time. But John deserts them. I got a feeling I'm not going to get through all the rest of this, and I'm going to wrap it up here, okay? We're going to pick up next time because it gets really exciting. The book of Acts, the book of Acts, is like an action packed movie. It's an adventure. It's a, you know, it's like the first front, first adventure, not the last, you know, frontier. It's the first frontier. He's, they're taking the gospel to places that had never been. And it's exciting. There's opposition. There's success. It's just, there's tragedy. There's success. There's defeat. There's, there's so much going on here. It's just a wonderful book. But the bottom line is, Jesus said, I will build my church. Go and make disciples of all nations. Get the word out. All right. Which leads me to what I want to wrap up with. We had a really successful prayer card blitz in uh, December. Remember what I was talking about? We, we, we had our prayer outreach sheets like this, prayer outreach sheets. I think there were 10 of us all together. One came in late, 10, 10 that filled out these sheets. We sent out over 400 postcards. There were guests here on Christmas Eve that came to be anonymous because they got our postcards. One of them even said, it was that handwritten note. Anybody who would take the time to write me a handwritten note, that's why they came. They were blown away. A handwritten note inside, not just another card. So, I like outreach evangelism, and I, I want us to do that. I want to do this all over again for Easter. So I'm looking for people who say, hey, I'll take one of those sheets. I'll go through a neighborhood. I'll pray for the, uh, the homes on that list so that we can send them a postcard. This is our Easter postcard. I put it together already. It's on paper. I didn't put it on post stock yet. It's called, He Took Our Place, But Why? And on the back side it says, He Took Our Place, But Why? This Easter, discover why God allowed Jesus to die and rise again. There, are, there is a reason, and it has to do with you. God cares about you so much, and we will share the proof that he does. Join us Easter Sunday. The service will be will have a casual atmosphere, and if you so desire, you can remain anonymous. Just sneak in and out. Please come and find out why Jesus took your place. Okay, just a real simple postcard. We're going to send those to everyone that we sent a Christmas card to. All right? And... Uh, those who participate in doing the outreach here, we made up cards to go to them with space to write a personal note. Now, I had a long personal note. Whew. And after, you know, because I, um, I had 130 of them I sent to, it got shorter and shorter and shorter. <laughs> they won't read it if it's too long either, if, Well, I write large, so it filled the whole side. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> The only guy that I know is right larger than me is Roger. <laughs> but it's the same thing on the inside. It's on the back side of the postcard. But it gives you an opportunity. It costs us the same price to do either one. Okay. But uh, so what we want to do is encourage everyone who will. If, if everybody in the church did this, instead of just 10 people, you know, if we had everybody doing it, we'd be sending out a 1,000 invitations. And instead of maybe five or six people coming in, we might see 50 people coming in. And so uh, it's a very simple, simple method. All I do is I go through a neighborhood, I pause in front of the houses. I do. I pause in front of the house and you I write say, "Write down the addresses." Is that it? Yep. And I write down the address, the street, the city, and if there's a clue, out, like it says on the mailbox, the Johnsons, to write that down. That way we can make it a little bit more personal. And, and then, but I pray as I'm taking that down, Lord, my heart's desire and prayer for this house is. That they might become, they might come to faith in Jesus and to our church. Okay, and that's that's what we do. We just go through a neighborhood, you do that, and then you bring the list to us. We make a copy and give you back your list, so you can continue praying for those that neighborhood. You can pray for them. You can say, I pray for this address one every day. And, you, and if you got thirty on a sheet, you're doing one every every day of the month. When we send the cards out, we prayed over them that God would touch those people's hearts and bring them in. And we don't know what He'll do from there. Look what He did, the Apostle Paul. Okay, he, he got his attention. Uh, I imagine somebody who's uh, struggling. I don't know who will be out there. 
They're struggling because a spouse walked out on them, the world's caving in, and they're saying, and he took my place. I need to, I, I need to find out more. And showing up. I, I don't know what the, the need may be. That somebody, that God loves me, uh, I want to come find out more. And so uh, we want you to be a part of that. So I'm going to put some of these on all your tables here just before we leave. And we'll wrap up in prayer because I don't want to go any longer. All right? Let's pray right now. Father in heaven, I pray that you'll bless our outreach for Easter. Uh, that we might, uh, Lord, penetrate our community here like uh, they did in the book of Acts. In chapters, uh, the first entry trap, chapters, the first nine, where all of Jerusalem, Lord, was hearing about the resurrected Jesus Christ. We want to saturate our Jerusalem, Waterford here, and West Bloomfield, and Pontiac. And Lord, then we want to reach our region, our, our Samaria. And then, Lord, through the goods, we know we're reaching the ends of the earth. So bless us, Lord. Bless our enterprise. May we be missionary-minded. May, may we share the gospel, invite people to come to Bethany uh, so that they can hear the word and find the Savior and discover the love of God and forgiveness and all a whole new life. To be in Christ with the old gone and the new here. We just pray for that, Lord. So bless our outreach, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.